You know when you say a community gets put on the map, it could be for good or bad. Now, uh, Nash Creek, New Brunswick has a great uh, connection with me and many people of the North Shore. I was the journalist that was covering Nash Creek for the Campbellton Tribune, Dalhousie News, Moncton Times, Nord Light, and other publications for, geez, three decades. Uh, Nash Creek is the what he called the center of the Resco Shore region. It connects Route 11 and Route 134. Now, many families call the region home, very prestigious families, and one of them is the McNair family. Now, the McNair family are, uh, they're uh, business owners, they're athletes, they're academics. Uh, some of them have been involved with farming, fishing, uh, mechanics, uh, stuff like that. So it was kind of ironic that the most wanted fugitive for many people of the 2000s uh, was caught there. And guess what? His last name was McNair. No relation. Now, today we're going to be talking about the curious case uh, of Richard Lee McNair. Now, his chronology of his actions as a fugitive and on the run were chronicled in my paper, The Tribune, uh, in the late 2000s. It was made into a book, The Man That Mailed Himself. Now, uh, not to dissuade or be humorous with this, this was a wanted criminal. He was, uh, again, escaped. He was a murderer, attempted murderer, a burglar, and an escapee. Now, Richard Lee McNair, born December 19, 1958, in Altus, Oklahoma, uh, was known for his ability to escape and elude capture. In 1987, he murdered one man and shot a second man four times during a botched robbery. robbery. Now, he has since been captured, and he's currently serving two terms of life in a mega prison uh, for these crimes, including escaping from prison in the corporate prison in Florence, Colorado. After McNair's initial arrests, he escaped three times from three different institutions using various creative methods. On his first attempt, he used lip balm to squeeze out of a pair of handcuffs. He escaped a second time by crawling through a ventilation duct, uh, similar to what Ted Bundy did. In the last escape from a federal prison in April 2006, he mailed himself out of prison in a crate and successfully convinced a police officer he was not the prison escapee, but actually a recreational jogger. This resulted in his mugshot being featured a dozen times on the TV shows America's Most Wanted, which was very popular in the rest of the Shore region, but we're going to talk about this in a second because it ties into his capture, and made him one of the top 15 fugitives wanted by U.S. Marshals at the time. Now, McNair eventually traveled to Canada twice in order to evade capture, uh, traveling across the country uh, for more than uh, 12 months before being apprehend apprehended in a random police check. Much of what the public knows about McNair's escape and his time as a fugitive is through McNair's prison correspondence with a Canadian journalist, Byron McChristopher, who calls the Camelton region home, and again, his articles appeared in the Tribune before it became in a book form. Now, in November 1987, while attempting a burglary in Minot, North Dakota, he was surprised by two men and murdered one of them. McNair's murder of Jerry Thies occurred at a grain elevator operated by the Farmers Union Elevator Company while McNair was a sergeant posted at the nearby Minot Air Force Base. A second man was shot four times, but survived. When the police called McNair in for questioning, he surrendered a concealed handgun. He was later sentenced to two life terms for murder and attempted murder, and a 30-year prison sentence for burglary. Now, his first escape attempt occurred at the Minno Municipal Police Station in 1988, shortly after he'd been arrested. McNair's first period as a fugitive lasted only a few hours, after which McNair was quickly recaptured. After his first arrest, McNair was handcuffed to a chair and left in a room with three detectives. Again, he used lip balm, which he had in his pocket, as a lubricant to squeeze his hands free from the handcuffs. McNair then led police on a chase on foot through the town, eventually being chased up a three-flight stairway in an effort to evade capture. After becoming surrounded by police on the roof of a three-story building downtown, he attempted to jump to a tree branch to escape arrest, but the branch broke. McNair eventually landed on the ground and hurt his back, after which he was easily apprehended. After McNair was released from the hospital, he was moved to the Ward County Jail in Minot. 
In February 88, sheriff's deputies discovered another escape attempt when, after moving McNair to another cell, they found two cinder blocks partially chiseled out from the stairs shallowly was he being held. Now, in October 92, he escaped with 200 prisoners from the North Dakota State Penitentiary in Bismarck, North Dakota, by crawling through a ventilation duct. One of the prisoners who escaped with McNair was apprehended within hours, and the other within days. After his escape, he grew out his hair and dyed it blonde in an attempt to disguise himself. Much of the time as he run was spent roaming the states in stolen cars. He remained free for 10 months until he was eventually arrested in Grand Island, Nebraska in 1993. After his second recapture, the North Dakota Department of Corrections deemed McNair a problem inmate, no, no pun intended, and arranged his transfer through the interstate compact to Minnesota Correctional Facility at Oak Park Heights. After a number of years at this facility and realizing he would not be able to escape, he participated in a sit-down strike that caused his return to North Dakota, and he's later transferred to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. He was assigned to the maximum security United States Penitentiary, Florence High, which is next to, next to but distinct from ADX Florence. Again, realizing that escape would be unlikely, he arranged a transfer to the United States Penitentiary, Pollock, on the grounds this was marginally closer to his parents' home in Oklahoma. Now, on April 5, 2006, he escaped from the United States Penitentiary in Pollock, Louisiana. McNair's duties in prison including work in a manufacturing area where he would repair old torn mailbags. He held this position for several months, throughout which McNair plotted his escape. He escaped by hiding himself in a specially constructed escape pod, which included a breathing tube, which was buried under a pile of mailbags. The pallets were shrink-wrapped and fork forklift to a nearby warehouse inside of the prison fence. After prison staff delivered McNair's pallet and went for lunch, he calmed himself out of his escape pod and walked through the unsecured area to freedom. Now federal investigators believe that McNair must have received help from other inmates to escape, but McNair has always maintained that he acted alone. Now, the pallet was shipped out of prison around 9.45 a.m. and he was able to exit the pallet around 11 a.m. McNair was aware that it would be done until 4 p.m. that the prison would find him missing. His plan was to go to a nearby town of Alexandria, Louisiana, where he would steal supplies and transportation. Now, hours after escape from Pollock, McNair was stopped while running away on a railroad track near Ball, Louisiana, by police officer Carl Bordelin, sort of like uh, in the heat of night. This incident was captured on a video camera mounted in the Bordelon's patrol car. He had no ID and proceeded to give the officer the alias of Robert Jones. When asked again five minutes later, he gave a different alias, Jimmy Jones, no, no, no relation to the Montreal Alouettes quarterback, though the officer did not notice the different answer. McNair eventually laughed and joked with the officer, and even as the officer got a matching description of the inmate, he appeared collected and calm. He successfully convinced the officer he was jogging and in town <coughs> to help on a post-Katrina roofing project, allowing him to go back to jogging within 10 minutes. One factor that made it easier for McNair to escape arrest was that the photo provided to police was low quality and was at least six months old. Another was that the prison had told police that they had not completely sure McNair had escaped. Bordelon himself claimed they let McNair go because the physical description of McNair given to police was completely different from how McNair actually appeared. Over the 10 minutes that Bordelon questioned McNair, he remained calm and provided completely plausible explanations, eventually convincing the officer that his alibi was true. McNair later wrote that he did not see the cruiser because it was blocked from view by trees and that he planned to run he was not able to convince the officer of his innocence. McNair later denied the suggestion that he would have assaulted the police officer confronted, claiming that he had renounced violence after the initial arrest. McNair described his escape as a get-out-of-jail-free card and described his feelings after the confrontation with the officer as relief, disbelief, bewilderment. McNair agreed that he did not resemble his present picture. Now, the officer remained with the Ball Police Department for the rest of his life, eventually becoming assistant police chief before his death in 2015 at the age of 51. Now, on, uh, when he moved to Canada, 
Uh, this was before the U.S. Marshals added McNair to the 15 most wanted list. Do you know that McNair was the first prisoner to escape from a federal prison since 1991? Later that April, about two weeks after escape, he successfully crossed into B.C. from Blaine, Washington. On April 28, 2006, RCMP in Penticton, B.C. confronted McNair while investigating a stolen car that was driving, which was parked at a local beach. The officers asked McNair to step out of the car to be questioned, which he did, but ran across a nearby field and outran the officers soon after being confronted. The police impounded the car but did not realize the identity of McNair until two days later when one of the officers recognized him from an episode of America's Most Wanted. Subsequent investigation found a digital camera full of self-portraits, which police determined were probably for the purpose of producing fake IDs. When authorities examined the car, he found McNair's fingerprints confirming that he was in Canada. Now, after escaping arrest in Penticton, uh, McNair rode a bike to Kelowna. Because it took several days for the police to confirm his identity, it was easy for McNair to escape the area. In May 2006, he traveled back to the States when he drove a Subaru from Vernon, B.C. to Blaine, Washington. McNair then traveled across the States and eventually crossed back into Canada from Minnesota. After arriving back in the Great White North, McNair traveled through southern Ontario, then traveled west to Vancouver. Now, early on, McNair developed a plan to buy land in central BC around Williston Lake after seeing ads for the property. He changed his mind after visiting the area and finding that a drought and pine beetle infestation had devastated the area. The fact that there was only one road in and out of the property also made McNair uncomfortable. Now in 2007, he traveled to eastern Canada. He drove through the Laurentian Highlands in Quebec where he enjoyed mountain biking. He spent a lot of time around Lac Saint Jean, and he ne nearly attempted to cross back to the States again at Derby Line, Vermont, but the high security on the American side convinced him that attempting to cross back would be too risky. Now, he eventually traveled to Halifax, St. John, and other uh, points. He also spent about two months in Franklin, New Brunswick, before he was again confronted by police. Now, he said in published reports many times that he loved being in Franklin. Now, a lot of people have never been to the provincial capital of New Brunswick. I can, uh, I can say it is one of the nicest and the most scenic and the most busy uh, uh, cities in all of Canada. A lot to do. There's uh, restaurants, uh, bars, shopping, uh, tourist attractions. Again, the population, 65,000. It's your perfect Canadian small city, and he loved it in, in Franklin. We'll get into that in a second. Now, on April 8, 2006, three days after McNair's escape, America's Most Wanted ran its first profile of McNair. The program would go on several times to detail McNair, a total uh, uh, many, many times, uh, on television and nine times on radio, so 21 different posts. The last time McNair was featured was on November 24, 2007, a month after his recapture. <coughs> Over the period of McNair's time in Canada, Canadian viewers made over 50 reports to the RCMP confirming that the fugitive had been seen north of the border. Now, McNair watched America's Most Wanted intently, describing the show as a thorn in his side. McNair confirmed after his capture that whenever a new episode of America's Most Wanted aired, he would buy food and fuel his vehicle. Then it featured, uh, then it featured would keep it low for a couple of days. Now, throughout this time as a fugitive, he tracked his own story on the internet. After his recapture, he commented that the ongoing coverage of him was, for the most part, true, and Louisiana Marshal Glenn uh, Belgard attempted to capture McNair online with help of a criminal profiler. McNair suspected that Louisiana police had attempted to contact him by posing as a woman online who said that she would like to hide him in their basement. McNair was surprised by how much the media coverage focused on him, especially the 11-page article that appeared in The New Yorker written by Mark Singer on October 9, 2006. Now, McNair was computer literate as he owned several laptops while living as a fugitive. After having his laptop seized in Pecticton, he began to store most of his information on USB sticks. With the help of a scanner, digital camera, Photoshop, and a pet ID website, he was able to produce a passable fake Alaska driver's license. He learned how to rig the video camera to his laptop so that he can cut his own hair. Now, one of McNair's laptops was dedicated solely to monitoring a Louisiana-based website, which closely followed all media coverage of McNair. Now, 
In order to support himself, he stole vehicles and cash from car dealerships. Because he had once worked as a car salesman himself, he knew where to find cash and keys at such dealerships and how to avoid security. He stole not only new, not only new vehicles since he had windows that McNair only stole new vehicles since he had window stickers indicating whether a vehicle was equipped with a GPS style a tracking system. If it was, he wouldn't touch it. McNair avoided driving conspicuous looking vehicles, preferring white vehicles that everybody has. He once considered stealing a quarter or three quarter ton trunk camper, but one of the supposed sightings of McNair was in North Dakota, of all places in a truck with camper, so he eventually settled on a van instead. In one incident, while McNair was staying in a motel near Chilliwack, B.C., he left to buy something and returned to 504 in the motel surrounded by SWAT teams. McNair began to flee in his car, but later found out a local AM radio station that the police were responding to a hostage situation at the motel. McNair then returned to the scene and filmed the standoff with a Sony HD video camera, which he had recently purchased. This episode lasted for another 20 minutes. Now, let's get to what happened in Ash Creek again. Uh, my my home area, I was also mayor as a local service district chairman. Not at the time, but uh, let me tell you, there was a lot of excitement. Now, on October 24, 2007, seven days before Halloween, uh, near the creek, off-duty RCMP constable Dan Melanson spotted an expensive-looking white cube van with crappy-looking... Uh, uh, tinted rear windows and interior license plate. Now to break down the uh, geography of the Nash Creek area, you have Route 134 that borders the Atlantic Ocean, very scenic, very bright. You have the connector on the Route 11, which is not the Trans-Canada, but it's your typical two-lane major highway in, in northern New Brunswick. Any car that they were trying to find, but the RCMP would use that as a lookout for speeders uh, on the highway. And this is a connector, ladies and gentlemen. It would connect to the back settlements with over 1,600 people. It would collect, uh, collect to the metro areas of Bathurst and Cableton, which is 35 miles uh, either way on the either side. And uh, anything that's uh, conspicuous is going to... Uh, to uh, be uh, shy like a like a new penny. Now, the crappy looking tinted rear windows and the entire license plates would tip a lot of people off because of the mafia uh, that were prevalent up there in the late 2000s uh, and the, uh, the 2000s would be seen with this type of vehicles or we call the white van approach. Now, suspecting that the van was stolen and are being used again to smuggle alcohol or cigarettes, the German Slager case where the local pimp and, uh, and uh, drug dealer was caught. Melanson noted that the plate number that the, that the van was heading to Campbellton, a nearby city. Now, Melanson did not attempt to uh, apprehend McNair, but his report alerted other RCMP in Campbellton of the presence of McNair's vehicle. McNair had, in fact, tinted the windows himself in a London, Ontario park. The next day, Constable Stéphane Gagnon, a six-week rookie, spotted McNair's van by chance in downtown Camelton and pursued it. Following a low-speed car chase and a subsequent foot chase, he was successfully arrested with the help of his field coach, Constable Nelson Levesque. In October 2008, the U.S.-based International Association of Chiefs of Police awarded Balanson the Looking Beyond the License Plate Grand Prize for his role in apprehending McNair. McNair himself described his capture as simply the product of bad luck. As he put it, it was just one of those days. He was transferred eventually to the Atlantic Institution, a Canadian Federal Maximum Security Penitentiary in Renus, while awaiting extraditions in the States. Mounties lady told the media that McNair was cooperative with his capture and even joked with them. When one officer asked McNair what the reward was for his capture, McNair said 25000 That does That's uh, that, uh, that's not much, said the officer. McNair replied that it was because all the government money is tied up in Osama bin Laden's reward. Pretty well true. Now, McNair later described the Campbellton RCP as good men during their job, and I tend to agree. Some good cops in Campbellton. Now, McNair is currently incarcerated again at ADX Florence, a supermax prison near Florence, Colorado. ADX Florence has a reputation as the Alcatraz of the Rockies. 
It houses some of the United States' most dangerous prisoners who have been deemed too great a security risk for even a maximum security prison. When McNair was captured, several law enforcement officers told AMW that he was almost certainly spent the rest of his life in the Supermax. Now McNair now spends most of his every day in a 12 by 17 foot concrete cell. He lives in a pod with 500 prisoners. With no access to the internet, prison staff screen and reject McNair's incoming mail if it deals with topics prohibited by federal regulations, such as escape plans. In the immediate correspondence, McNair described his location as the most secure section of the most secure prison in the world, but expressed reservations about discussing specific details of his incarceration. Thank God for prisons, McNair wrote. There are some very sick people in here. Animals who would never want living near a family or the public in general. I don't know how the correction staff deal with it. They get spit on, shit on, abused, and have been seen to risk their own lives and save a prisoner many times. Now, in 2008, Byron Christopher, a crime reporter from the same New Brunswick town where McNair was captured, initiated a correspondence with McNair via mail. In his first letter, Christopher included a picture they had taken of the town, uh, taken near the place that McNair was arrested. He told McNair that he hoped the Campbellton Chamber of Commerce would write a check to McNair for all the publicity who had brought to the town and wrote to McNair about the recent World Series and federal election. Christopher included three American dollars in order to cover the cost of paper and postage, but the president returned his money. When McNair wrote back to Christopher, it was his first response to the media. The letter revealed <coughs> many personal details about McNair's most recent escape, which had previously been unknown. Revealing that he had spent time hiding in Franklin, McNair described Franklin's residence as very friendly and well-educated. Again, I can back that up 100%. He revealed that his favorite se uh, serial was the Christian Science Monitor. Campbellton's uh, local newspaper, The Tribune, covered a correspondence in detail. And again, uh, we were known at the time for having major essays published on books, or artwork, and stuff. The Campbellton Tribune is considered the voice uh, Restigush, literally and figuratively, that's her name, or was her name, and uh, we took great pride in bringing the information to the public because there's always background with a, with a criminal that if you have the opportunity to present it, because just like, uh, you know, Gowan said, uh, I'm a smooth criminal, am I really so bad? You know, is the way it goes. Now, in subsequent letters to Christopher, uh, McNair revealed details uh, about his escape and travels through Canada, providing most of what the public knows about McNair's time as a fugitive. McNair had an interest in discussing his story with a British TV reporter, but suspects that the correspondence may have been terminated by prison censors. Now, Christopher later compiled his correspondence, uh, conducted additional research on the story, and eventually produced a book on McNair, The Man Who Mailed Himself Out of Jail. It was released via Amazon on June 20, 2013. The book, again, is a follow-up to the Running Man series, which was published by, uh, by our paper in 2009. Now, uh, not, not to sound uh, making light of this, and I'm not, you know, uh, he wasn't a stupid guy. But the problem is when you're on the run, on the run, on the run, on the run, you could be right 99 times and be caught 100 times. He had no idea that the uh, the rural areas of that part of the New Brunswick were serviced by the RCMP. Now, uh, Campbellton, again, 30 miles away from Nash Creek, but the cops that were working in Campbellton were just as connected to the cops working in Nash Creek. Jack and River had a depot for a number of years, the RCMP. They had uh, the Lousy Police Force had uh, closed. The RCMP took over. So again, there was a connection all the way over from Nash Creek. And what really stood out as well, it was rare to see an Ontario van with tinted windows. That's what killed them. Because the uh, cops were trained, if you see something with tinted windows, or what he called the drug vans, in Holton, New Brunswick, the big border crossing for people in northern New Brunswick, even though it was over 200 miles away, many fugitives, including 
my uh, great uncle Jordan Slegger, the oldest pimp and drug dealer in Northern Brunswick history, they were tipped off by the white vans he was using to transfer materials. So what would stand out in Northern Brunswick, again, Mafia and Balmoral, Bearsford locally, tinted windows and a white van, and that's from Bustlem. And had no indication he was part of any any organized mafia, so uh, it was very interesting. But I know uh, my friends up home, my mechanic, mechanic is a McNair, they got a big kick over the fact that this guy uh, spelled his name correctly, you know, because some people spell M-A-C, but McNair is a big spelling up home. Uh, and, uh, you know, he looks like, not to sound weird, he just looks like a local fisherman or lumberjack. If he would have hit himself and, you know, driven a Cavalier or a, a Neon or whatever, he probably wouldn't have got caught. But the thing is, you, if you overthink it, or underthinking you're going to be caught. But being on the run is, like I said, it's no life. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of the man who mailed himself, or the running man, we call him. If you uh, li uh, like what you're doing here with our True Crime Podcast, give us a like, comment, or subscribe. If you want to check out Nash Creek, if you're living in southern New Brunswick, go 200 miles north. We're not hard to find. Look for the beautiful white church, St. Joseph's uh, Church. Uh, built 1833 right by the beautiful Bay of Chalor with the Blue Mountains of Quebec in the background take a drive up and you can visit the exact location where the, the, the most important fugitive in American history over the last 25 years were found. We should do a roadside monument like Kilroy was here. Have a good day. Bye.